everyone. On behalf of the library, good evening and welcome to our Holocaust Remembrance event. It is good to see so many people here tonight. We have invited Clarice Wilsey to talk about her father's experience at Dachau concentration camp. Clarice is a member of the Holocaust Center for Humanity and she is volunteering her time and compassion to keep history alive. Thank you, Clarice, for coming to Camby. Thank you all for being here tonight. This presentation will be videotaped, so it will be available on Channel 5 and on the library's website for future viewing. There will be a question and answer session at the end, so if you have a question, please step to the microphone, uh, step up front here to the microphone and uh, place your question. Uh, at this point, please silence your cell phones and please welcome Clarice Welsey. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate being invited. And for those of you in the way back, if you cannot hear me, would you please like raise your hand really high because I want to make sure. The last time I talked, I thought I had a big enough voice and they didn't all hear me, so they had to raise their hand. So I want to be sure that you can hear me. Again, my name is Clarice Wilsey, and I always like to know a teeny bit about the people who uh, I listen to when they're giving a presentation. I just retired uh, December 31st after 20 years at the University of Oregon as a faculty and an administrator. I have 40 years of experience at universities, but don't do any of the math. <laughs> um, but the reason I retired is that as I talk about my story, this story, it is so huge and large for me and my family, and I really feel that I want to be able to talk about this experience that my father had. In a couple of his letters, he said to my mother, tell thousands so that millions will know what Dachau is and never forget the name of Dachau. And because he couldn't talk about it, that's now my mission. So even though I loved working at the University of Oregon, go Ducks, um, I believe that it's really important me, for me to spend my time and my energy speaking to different groups. I've been speaking to high schools, colleges, libraries, synagogues, churches, museums. Um, where else have I spoken? Anyway, I have spoken to a, a number of groups. This is actually my 21st talk. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. I am on the Speakers Bureau for the Holocaust Center for Humanity in Seattle. I'm also on the Speakers Bureau for the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education in Portland. And I'm involved in both of these, partly because I really want to get the word out. I really want to be able to speak. Uh, I live in Oregon, but in essence, my father's story is a Washington story. So what does that mean? My father was one of 27 physicians that went into con uh, Dachau concentration camp at Liberation with the Rainbow Division of General Patton's army. And those physicians, those 27 physicians, and then there were nurses, and I'm not sure how many nurses and medics that were there, were locked in for over a month, about five and a half weeks, to give medical care to the former prisoners. Now, why were they locked in? Well, there was typhus, typhoid, tuberculosis. The people had been basically starved, to, not to death, those people, but they had been starved, they were very malnourished, they had very little liquid, they were dehydrated, and medically, the doctors felt that they couldn't leave. They had to control the amount of food and drink that they had because their digestive systems, et cetera, couldn't handle that. So I want to talk a second about uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, there's two. There's the International Holocaust Remembrance Day on January 23rd, or sorry, January 27th. And that day is to um, honor all um, Holocaust incidences and genocide in the whole world. So that could include Rwanda, it could include the Rohingyas, and of course, uh, World War II and, and the Holocaust. Yom HaShoah is the Hebrew word for Holocaust Remembrance Day. And Yom HaShoah, which is always either the end of April or early May, this year it happens to be May 1st, 
is specifically for the six million plus Jewish people that died at the hands of the Nazis. So I want to honor all of those people who died. I want to honor the people who lived and continued to have really meaningful lives. So why do I say that my talk is about Letters from Dachau, a journey of words, though rarely spoken? My father was a very verbal man. He was always talking about things. And as I talk about his letters, as I describe him as a person, his experience, you're going to discover that he was a very verbal person. But there was something he couldn't talk about. And that was his experience at Dachau concentration camp. It was such a horrific experience that he just couldn't talk about it. My brother and my sister and I grew up in Spokane, Washington. And we knew that he'd been in, in World War II. We knew that he'd been in the front lines of Germany in an evacuation hospital. We knew that he'd been in Dachau, but we knew kind of like this much. So if we ever asked a question, if we ever wanted to find out something about the details, he would either say, you don't need to know about this, or he would give us kind of a dirty look, kind of, you don't need to know about this. And the look was such that we knew no more verbs, nothing. Our mother wouldn't talk about it. Neither of them could talk about it. So we grew up kind of with this notion that something had happened, but we really didn't focus on it because it was a non-subject. So let me read to you one of the letters that he wrote to my mother. This was on June 1st, 1945, after he'd been there for over a month. Please, darling, don't feel you have to rant on paper about Dachau. I know you see and know it for what it was, and that's all I care. All I ask is that you instill it into as many thousands others as you can, till maybe we can get millions to see it and never forget the name of Dachau. And that's my mission right now. That's my calling, to be able to talk about this and to remind people that not just Dachau happened, but the Holocaust happened. And we're continuing to have different forms of Holocaust genocide uh, throughout our world. And we need to be able to say it did happen to those who try to say it didn't happen. And we need to be able to think about how we, in the sphere of our lives, can do something about hatred, cruelty, and bigotry. So the story actually is um, at this point from 1945 to now is 74 years. On this coming Monday, April 29th, 19, I'm sorry, not, this is 2000, right? 2019 will be the 74th anniversary of the liberation of Dachau. And when I think about that, I'm just like, oh my gosh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> But it's so important to never forget, just as my father had asked us to never forget. So I don't know about you, but I really didn't know all this geography. So on the far right, you'll see Dachau concentration camp. In the middle, it says 4,700 miles. On the left, Bismarck, North Dakota. Now, I don't know if you all know where Bismarck, North Dakota is, but that's where my mother was living with her parents after my dad went to war. She and my father uh, were at Fort Devens in Massachusetts near Boston. And then my father was deployed to Germany and France. And then my little brother, my baby infant brother, I wasn't alive then, uh, was born, had a very serious heart condition, wasn't expected to live. So then my dad sent my mom and my little brother to uh, Bismarck to live with her parents. I'm happy to say he's now in his 70s. So um, they were wrong when they said he'd only lived to be six years old. So that's, that's the good news. But as you can see, they went from a lot of different places. And it's amazing to me that 300 letters arrived to my mother in Bismarck, North Dakota. <clears throat> OK. so. Somewhere in Germany, somewhere else in Germany, somewhere else again in Germany. These were the salutations that my father put on his letters. Now, you may or may not know this, but the military would not allow 
the soldiers to say exactly where they were. They just didn't want the enemy to know where they were. So it was this vague kind of somewhere in Germany, somewhere else in Germany. Um, and my mom was living in Bismarck in this perilous war. Now the th letters went initially from Dachau, the front lines of Germany and France. And this is interesting. I didn't even know he was in France until after I found the letters. And I found the letters 15 years after he had died and a year after our mother had died. So they went from Germany, France, Dachau, to Bismarck, North Dakota, to Minneapolis, where they lived after the war, where I was born. And then they moved to Spokane, Washington, lived in two houses, and if you will believe it, they lived through a fire in the attic. They were in a box, in a trunk, in the back of the attic, and there was a house fire, and they lived through, those, uh, through that fire. Not only that, they were never redacted. There were two letters that were censored and redacted. But other than that, they weren't. Now, was that because he was a physician, because he was a captain? Was it, who knows why, they weren't censored? My friends who had fathers in World War II have started looking at their father's letters, and a number of them were censored or blocked out or scratched out or whatever. So fortunately, um, they weren't. They were discovered in 2009 after my mother and my father had died and we had spent, it was a year after my mom died and we'd been you know, clearing out the family home of 56 years and we were shoving boxes into cars and vans and trucks and I mean we hadn't even time to go through everything. But somehow they ended up in my garage and in the fall of 2009, in a rainy day, on a rainy day in Eugene, Oregon, I opened this box and I found these letters, which I'm going to talk about. After the war, my father still loved words. He loved big, creative words. God-given, grandiose, glorious mountains. He was very creative in the kinds of words that he would use. And right in the middle of our living room, was a big unabridged dictionary, something similar to this. Now, we were little kids, young kids, and if we didn't know what a word meant, guess what? We had to look it up in the dictionary. Well, now, mind you, we might not know how to spell it. So, you know, try, figure out how to spell it, kind of sound it out, would be my father. Once in a while, he'd give us a clue. But then we still had to find the word. Well, we'd find the word, and then that wasn't enough. Guess what? We had to use the word in a sentence to know we knew how to use the word. Well, professionally, that has come in handy. <laughs> but at the time, no. It was not fun. It was not enjoyable. And I probably ended up not asking what a word meant. <laughs> but I don't know that for sure. OK. So I want to give you another example of some of the creativity of the words in which he used. Now, to give a little side, my mother was a physical therapist. She was one of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's physical therapists in Warm Springs, Georgia, when he was president. And Warm Springs, Georgia was the Southern White House. And he had a polio rehabilitation center there. And I think you all probably know, maybe except for our younger folks, that President Roosevelt had polio. So my mom was there as one of the physical therapists. So this is a letter he wrote to my mother on April 13th, 1945, which was the day after Roosevelt died. I felt for you on February, oh, it's February, sorry, Friday 13th, 1945, April, when I learned of Roosevelt's dying. At the moment, we were certainly far from anyone on a high crest of half mountainous nature sort of awesome nature. It's hard to describe my feelings out of the hugeness of world, death, and geography. Life all swooped at one in an awesome, horrible, yet beautiful manner in one massive gulp at me. Well, I had to read that a few times. <laughs> but you know, for all the fascination of words that he had, he just couldn't talk about Dachau. He was never one to march in a parade or you know, go to a veterans meeting or put on his uniform. I mean, it was like, no, none of that ever happened. Um, when 
he, we would talk when somebody on the new, the only time that we actually heard him talk about Dachau or the Holocaust was if somebody on the news said that it didn't exist. And he would go ballistic. I was there, I know it happened. And then he would let out a string of expletives about what he thought about the Nazis. And they weren't pretty words. He really, and then of course we would think, well, tell us about it. You know, we'd start asking questions. You don't need to know about this. Or a disdainful look. And we knew at that point that nothing, nothing would be said, nothing would be answered. So there's an intertwining of my story as a little girl first discovering some pictures and then rediscovering the pictures and the letters later on. So on the left, I think I'm three or four years old. And on the right, I'm six years old. And that, I'm, I'm the one on the right, not the one standing on my mother's lap. That's my sister and my brothers in the background. So, I'm six years old, and we moved from one house of Spok in Spokane to another. And I was helping because there were a bunch of boxes in the dining room. Well, I was probably told to help, but anyway, I was looking through boxes. Six years old, mind you, I opened this box, and there are these horrible, horrible, horrible pictures that you've probably seen in history books or at a museum. Six years old. I never even had a pet die, so I, I knew nothing about that. So I asked my dad, what are these pictures? Well, he got angry again, went ballistic, my favorite phrase, and he um, said, little girls shouldn't know about this. Well, he's, he was right. But you know what? He grabbed him from my hand, and I never saw him again. But I never, ever forgot those pictures. Okay, how many of you have been to the Holocaust Museum in uh, Washington, D.C.? Okay, great. So, um, kind of go back and remember what you saw. Okay, so here's the Holocaust Museum in Seattle, I'm sorry, in Washington, D.C. Um, and what I'm about to tell you is very significant in terms of the future of this mystery uh, of my father's journey. This is written on May 8th, 1945, which actually, I don't know that he actually knew that day that it was the liberation, or not the liberation, I'm sorry, it was victory in Europe. I think they weren't always sure whether what day was what day because they never slept. So this was May 8th, which is the actual um, day that uh, Europe, uh, the end of, uh, end of the war in Europe. Why? The horror is so unbelievable that they flew congressmen to see it the day we came. The famous Washington, D.C. woman correspondence, Life Magazine, ate with us this noon to see it. Ambassador Caffrey to France saw it today. Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, is expected any minute. All Europe's biggest cabinet, ambassadors, newsreelers, etc., have been or are here to make sense seeing, believing. And then he says something very important to keep in mind. Look for me in a newsreel. I get goosebumps when I... I the reason I read the letters to you is that I want to make sure I read them the way he wrote them and not my own um, adaptation. So fast forward to 2006. Aren't you glad I'm not going from six years old to <laughs> whatever my age is now, which will remain silent. <laughs> okay, so um, I was in Baltimore at a conference and I was going to spend the weekend with some friends in Washington, D.C. and they had an event to go to and so I thought, well, I'll go to the Smithsonian. Even though I'd been to the Smithsonian before, that's the only real place I kind of knew about. So I'm on the train going to the Smithsonian and I hear people talking about the Holocaust Museum and I'm thinking, hmm, well, that was in the Holocaust. Well, maybe I'll go there. I've been to the Smithsonian. So I get off the train. I go walk to the uh, museum. Lot it was spring break for somebody because there were lots of teenager-type, middle school, high school kinds of aged kids. 
And I went in, and those of you who've been there, there's three elevators. The right elevator had like maybe 40, 50 people in it. The middle elevator had nobody. The left elevator had nobody. So I, wanting to be at the front of the line, stood in the middle elevator. This man in the line with 40, 50 people said, do you want to get in front of the line? Well, I hadn't asked to be in the front of the line, number one. Number two, if I had asked, most people would say, get to the back of the line, right? We don't usually let people jump in front of the line. Had that not happened, had he not offered that, the next thing could have easily not happened. So remember what I said, look for me in a newsreel, my father wrote. We go to the third, fourth floor, the doors open, and I'm the first one out, and in the first screen, there is my father walking across a path in front of a couple of former prisoners. And I'm like, I mean, I get goosebumps even now when I think about it. And I'm thinking, oh, well, yes, it's my dad. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Because I wasn't alive then. And so my memory of my father was more in his 70s and 80s as an adult of what I remember him to be like. And I'm thinking, well, I could be wrong and what have you. And this woman bumps into me and I go, that's my father, that's my father. And she goes, yeah. so then she watched it with me for a few more times. I'm thinking, you know, I'm 95% sure it was he, but I just, I just couldn't believe that it was. So I left, went through the rest of the museum uh, in minutes because it was like a quarter to five at that point. And I thought, I better figure out exactly where my father comes in at this uh, film. So I went back and I memorized where he came in at the film because it was probably 30 to 60 seconds at most, but it was in a, like a five minute film. And I figured out where it was. I went down to the main desk, the information desk, and I said, I'm 95% sure my father is in the film up there. Would you, does somebody here want to know who he is? Because it didn't say his name. And the young man said, oh, well, yes, but you know, it's two minutes to five and we're about to close. And I'm sure that the public relations office is closed or about to close. Here's her name, give her a call. So later that day, uh, or I mean, minutes after that actually, um, I went outside and I called my mother in Spokane. I go, mom, mom, you know, and I'm t all excited about telling her about this and there's just silence on the phone. I said, mom, I just saw a picture of dad at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Silence. Mom, say something. <laughs> she goes, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> that was all she said and I'm like, that's weird. So then I didn't get the reaction I wanted. So um, I called my brother and he was driving and at that point there weren't laws about driving and phoning. <laughs> and so um, he goes, oh, wait a minute, let me pull off the road. That was a shock in and of itself. So I said, Terry, guess what, blah, 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 blah. And he's like all excited. Then I called my sister, all excited. My mom, not excited. And I just, I can't figure it out. So the next time I was in Spokane, I would tell anybody who would listen, neighbors, friends, um, people at church, whatever, wherever I could tell somebody, I would tell them. And guess what my mom did? Nothing, no, never said a word. Somebody would ask her a question and she would just very carefully ignore the question or, or not speak to it or say something like, well, you know, that is very interesting. <laughs> okay, so um, it was a puzzle. It was a mystery. Now, mind you, at this point, no idea that we had any letters. No idea. Pretty much of a shock to see him at the museum in a film. Okay. So, that was 2006. So, life happens, and my mom had died, our mom had died, and we were cleaning the family home of 56 years. And remember when I was six and I saw those pictures? I had never forgotten those pictures. And so the whole time we were weeding through the house, I was looking for them. Didn't say anything to anybody. Not my brother, not my sister. Nobody knew I'd seen these pictures. I don't think I'd ever told anybody ever that I'd seen these pictures. So I'm looking, 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 looking. And after a while, after we got through, you know, all the weeding and boxing and what have you, I thought, well, I guess he must have thrown them away. He didn't, he didn't want anybody to see him. 
So um, it was a rainy, so we were shoving uh, boxes into carts and vans. The movers were wanting to move in. So we were just shoving anything. I mean, we didn't get the chance to look through a lot of boxes. We just shoved them. Well, one sunny, or sorry, one rainy Saturday afternoon, as you can well imagine in Eugene, as probably happens here in Canby, it was raining. I'm thinking, I wonder what's in those boxes. So I picked this one box up, and there, on the left, I opened up this box, and there were all these letters. Now, this box has been through multiple times by multiple people. But imagine this box in pristine condition, totally organized, never having been gone through. And guess what was in the middle of those letters? The pictures. Well, I, I started looking at the pictures. I started crying. I was like, I was just overwhelmed. Well, I knew that the liberation of Dachau was the end of April. So because they were in chronological condition, I found my way to the end of April. By coincidence, I found April 29th. This is what, this is the first letter that I read of my father's that I first discovered. We roared through the gates of Dachau minutes after its liberation while 40,000 plus wrecks of humanity milled, tore, looted, screamed, cried as like depraved beasts, which the Nazi SS had made them. In those early minutes, I saw captured SS tortured against a wall and then shot in what you Americans would call cold blood. But Emily, God forgive me, I can only say I saw it done without a single disturbed emotion. And he puts in big capital letters in all you know, scrolled over and over to make it even darker black because they so had it coming to them. After what I had just seen and what every minute more I have been seeing of the SS beast actions. I read several letters and I have to tell you, I cried. I'm not a crier, but I cried and I cried really hard. It just, the whole thing just, I can't tell you how overwhelming it was to me. So, uh, you know, life happens. And I neatly put the box away and just ignored them for a while. Uh, but they, and you know, it was in the, in the back of my mind. So I'll tell you more about that. Okay, um, this box, the printing is my grandfather's. Um, and it doesn't say it, it's my grandfather, but I recognize it. There's some medical equipment and I'm not sure, someday somebody's gonna tell me what that black thing is there. Um, and they, I have some medical equipment. One of these days I'm gonna ask a physician if they can tell me. I think uh, some of the equipment is German because there's German words on it. That's pretty smart of me, huh? <laughs> okay, so. Um, so as I said, um, let me talk a little bit about some of the details of Dachau in the front. My father was in the 116th Evacuation Hospital, uh, and he was part of Patton's Army. And the Rainbow Division of Patton's Army are the infantry people who went into Dachau to liberate. But what happened was they went in, everybody shot, I mean, everybody was shooting everybody at that point. The, uh, former prisoners grabbed the guns of the Nazis, the Nazis were shooting people, the prisoners were shooting guns, the GIs were shooting people. I mean, it was just mayhem. And my father, I don't know if you know this, doctors were not allowed to carry a gun. So he probably stood somewhere and watched this chaos and mayhem. And that's that letter that he said that he watched it without a feeling of emotion because they so had it coming to them. Okay. Um, he was on the front lines from se September of 1944 to April of 45. And again, not until I found these letters did I even know he'd been in France. He, it was always Germany. Um, on April 29th, my father's battalion liberated Dachau. Now, I don't know about you, but I had no idea where Dachau was. So, here we have Germany. And in red, you can see where Germany is. 
So it was in southern Germany in what they call Bavaria. Uh, what's interesting is I don't really know the distance, but some of the letters uh, after uh, Dachau was, uh, after he left Dachau, he was in Austria. And I didn't realize it, but Austria really probably is fairly close given what it looks like. Okay. So, um, a lot of the former prisoners were crying and yelling and happy and joyful and they were hugging people and then on the right, it kind of reminds me of Iwo Jima where they're raising the flag and uh, everybody's um, just so very happy. Um, and then the middle picture uh, is one of the trains that you may have heard that people were transported in trains and packed in and um, many people died in those trains. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about Dachau. Um, the number of prisoners that were inca incarcerated between 19... I've got to put my glasses on. Sorry. Uh, the number of prisoners incarcerated in Dachau between 1933 and 1945 exceeded 188,000 people. They were mostly political prisoners. Um, it wasn't initially like Auschwitz, which was for all the Jewish people. So it was people that somehow were offensive to Hitler and the Nazi party. The number of prisoners who died in the camp and the subcamps between 1933 and 1945 was at least 41,500. They never really know for sure exactly how many people died, but we do know that many, many people died. So can you see behind me when I stand over there? OK. Um, so do you see the front gate of Dachau? That's the famous front gate. And it says, Arbeit macht frei. And I, is that right, Hannah? How to pronounce it? OK. Now, basically in German, that says, work will set you free. What a joke. Now, in October of this year, I ended up going to Dachau for the first time. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But I just wanted to tell you something I learned there, which I thought was really smart on the behalf of the prisoners. At Auschwitz, they had the saying, work will set you free. But at Auschwitz, see the B of A-R-B-E-I-T? They took that B and did a little B and turned it upside down. And the Germans never figured it out. So it was just kind of like a... <laughs> so, I thought that was pretty clever on their part. But here it's the way it's supposed to be spelled. Okay, so these look like doctors. Uh, and these are some pictures, and I'm not sure um, which one might be my father. I know it's, I think it's the one that's, he's the one that's kind of being covered by another doctor. But in 1945, thousands of prisoners were moved to Dachau from other concentration camps and labor camps in the east. So a lot of them came from Russia, uh, the Ukraine, and ended up being re-imprisoned at Dachau. By the time the camp was liberated in 1945, there were around 60,000 prisoners. And again, these numbers, these numbers came from the Holocaust Museum in Seattle. So to be honest with you, um, you know, add a few, add a thousand, remove a few. My dad's letters stopped for about eight days because he had an infected finger. Well, in this country, you get an inf a finger that's infected, what do you do? Maybe put a little alcohol, a little mercurocom, you put a Band-Aid on, and you don't worry about it. But he was in the middle of typhus, typhoid, and tuberculosis, and a tiny little cut. So he had his hand wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped. And I kind of got a, a sick joke out of this. I guess the Germans had really great bandages. So he did live, but think about the fact that he, how easily he could have died from that little cut in his finger. And I also think, what did we miss in those eight days of letters that he couldn't write? So um, I want to read you, um, oh, the other thing I want to tell you about my father. Um, he was a very hygienic man. And you've all seen on uh, medical shows, you know, they're scrubbing for surgery and everything. Well, my dad, what's so interesting is when he was 
in the letter, she would talk about the released prisoners hugging them, covered with filth and lice and dirt, and they would hug him and he would hug back. Well, my dad was so hygienic, he would like scrub for dinner, <laughs> like he was scrubbing for surgery, and my brother and my sister and I would like go, oh. you know, come on dad, hurry up. So the fact that he was able to hug back people that had lice, that hadn't probably been bathed in umpteen you know, months, years. Okay, so here's another letter that um, I'd like to uh, tell you about. Now, let me tell you a little bit of an aside. Um, when I first um, started working on this, my brother had a friend, or has a friend, who um, is a reporter, a freelance reporter, and he contacted a professor at Duke University in North Carolina who said that my dad, in his opinion, used the word Holocaust earlier than a lot of people. So here is a, a combination of letters from around March 23rd, 1945. We are in a nightmarish holocaust, he wrote on March 23rd. The 116th evacuation hospital moved across France into Germany behind the advancing line. Gosh, darling, a guy just wonders how many times the world is going to ask for the holocaust messes to be gone through. Each one seems about the last straw, and yet more and more come. Then two days later, holocaust after holocaust, it's just wearing me to a nub. These guys were exhausted. On April 20th, as the 116th approaches Dhaka, April 29th, and rumors circulate about what might be found there, he wrote, we are the only evacuation hospital within 100 miles of this horrible Holocaust. Six days after that, April 26th. We had at least we hopes of not stepping right up into another Holocaust but preliminary reports at least indicate it might well be that nightmarish holocaust all over again. So they went into to hell three days later. Okay, here's another picture um, of what he called Dastardly Dachau. And he, um, throughout the letters, he called it Dastardly Dachau. So um, I think actually, I get, yeah, I'm sorry. I gave that to you already, okay. Okay, here's an example of what some of the letters look like. Now, you, you, won't, you won't be able to read it unless you get up really close. And as you see on the upper left, he writes, Dachau concentration camp, May thir 13 May 1945. And I'm just like, every letter that said that just kind of hit me. Um, and then in the red down below, he writes dastardly Dachau. Every letter was sent airmail special delivery, which I guess had to go airmail because it was from Europe to the United States. Okay, more pictures of surgery. My father uh, earned a bronze star, which is one of the highest medical honors that you can get for doing 5,000 anesthesias in the front lines. Now, what he did was really quite clever, uh, and yet he was able to do 5,000 anesthesias. So imagine seven gurneys, operating tables, and he would go around in circles in the center of all these operating tables, and he would give anesthesia as he would go around. And then he'd get around to the next person, and the next person, and the next person. 5,000, that is a whole lot of anesthesias. And think about the concentration, the fatigue, the exhaustion, and yet think of all the people that lived because of that. Okay, um, this is a fun picture. Uh, my father's the one on the far left of the right, the woman with her hands on the uh, man in front of her, she's a nurse, he's a physician, and on the back of that picture, the man and woman got married, and my dad walked her down the aisle, and they got married at Dachau. So even in a horrible, horrible place like that, romance can bloom, and happy things can happen. Okay, on the left, 
The typhus ward at Dachau, um, this is where a lot of the prisoners, former prisoners were kept who had typhus. They tried to contain certain illnesses in certain sections. So the typhus ward was this one. This happened to be, um, for the benefit of the younger people here, this happened to be the place where all the girlfriends were of the Nazi soldiers or the Nazi SS uh, people. Um, but they turned it into uh, a medical ward for typhus. The operating table, and I believe, okay, you see the man with the mask facing that away the, on the far right? The second one in, I'm pretty sure is my dad. I recognize his ear. <laughs> okay. Um, So, here is another, pic, uh, another letter about dastardly Dachau. Emily, we are sweating, stinking, existing in the hell on earth Dachau. Let every word of January or December, Reader's Digest, bore through the middle of your guts and multiply it a hundredfold. Dearest, the atrocity reports are true and more. For over eight days, I've lived, smelled, seen existed it as one of 27 doctors to try to correct the medical horror component of the hell on earth. Bodies starved to 50 pounds, men piled like rotting cordwood, huge gas chambers built like shower rooses, I'm sorry, shower rooms as a roos, hangman scaffolds, cremating ovens for dead, dying, or still conscious skin and bone wrecks of humanity. Stepping high as you walk to work over dead bodies in the street, Stormtroopers, the SS, riot prisoners, and man-eating Doberman pincer dogs, all rotting. Well, you know, millions of words have been written about Dachau, I'm sorry, about the Holocaust, and about Dachau. Written by historians, military personnel, survivors, all sorts of people have written about it. And yet there's still some people out there who try to say that it never existed. It's, it's just completely ludicrous to me. Okay, so um, here's another letter. This is uh, May 13th, 1945. He's been there a little, um, about two weeks. I flood you with routine latrine rumors, just because we get flooded with latrine, latrine rumors. I believe the rumor will materialize that they burn Dachau to the ground. Big, bold, black letters. It's funny, but we all just sort of hopefully wait with fiendish glee for that moment to see this dastardly place just roaring into flames. Maybe we're sort of like Nero's, huh? However, besides performing an ignominious end, justified, it would consume the typhus with it. To give you an idea, now remember she's in Bismarck, North Dakota. It would be like burning downtown Bismarck, yet residential Bismarck, SS barracks, officers, etc., would be left to live in for us, our patients, etc. So maybe the sword will be turned. And then he says an old quotation At Dachau, you enter by the door and leave by the chimney. This time and for all eternity, let us hope Dachau leaves by the chimney instead of its hundreds of thousands of people. Hooray, it will be gone. So um, we have more medical pictures. So um, on June 1st, 1945, he writes off, this is sort of funny, um, I'll admit that I'm a wee bit drunk, but you would be too if this was your last night at Dachau. To get away from here is an indescribable relief in and of itself. Later on June 12th, he writes to my mother, war in Dachau changes things. You'll just have to see for yourself. So again, he received the Bronze Star uh, and then after the war, uh, he was there, uh, he was actually stationed at Fort Knox in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, and then in March of 1946, um, he went home and left. 
Uh, and then he went to Minneapolis, uh, he and my mom, and he was a, me a, phys a physician, teacher, faculty person of anesthesia at the University of Minnesota. Um, that's a picture of me, he's holding me, and that's the picture of my brother. Um, and that began the time when he wouldn't talk about it. It was just the horror of what he had seen. And I can't read you all 300 letters, but they are gonna be online at the Holocaust Center for Humanity in Seattle as of in the middle to the end of June. We got a grant through uh, the University of Washington. It's formerly was the Masters of Library Science, but it's now called the iTechnology Department. So all the internet kinds of things. And so, for instance, if you looked at the letters and you wanted to see what he wrote about penicillin, you type in penicillin, and then up comes the letters that, where he talks about penicillin. Um, so he began a new life, and he and my mom were in Minneapolis for several years. And when I was two years old, I packed my diaper bag and moved to Spokane, Washington. So um, his letters are interlaced with humor, horror, love for her, love for my brother, and then despicable, despicable deeds and acts. I've, I've not read some of the really horrific letters. The ones I've read are pretty horrific, but there are some that are just really, really horrific. So if you're really wanting to read more of the letters, um, I would say maybe wait till early July to make sure that everything is, is settled. Um, my mom couldn't talk about it, my dad couldn't talk about it, and people have asked me, well, why do you think your mom didn't talk about it? I wondered myself, why didn't my mom talk about it? I've wondered why did they have the box of letters hidden in a trunk in the back of the attic in a box that they told nobody about? And they went from the front lines of Germany, France, and Dhaka to Bismarck, to Minneapolis, two houses in Spokane. And they lived through a fire in the second house of Spokane. But nobody mentioned those letters. So that's a mystery. It's a puzzle. I'll probably never know, other than I have speculation. And part of that speculation is that he did come back a different person. The letters that my mom received while she was caring for an ill son that she thought was gonna die, but didn't, fortunately, but at that time she didn't know. It was probably so horrific. Whether they made a verbal agreement or just a nonverbal, we're not gonna talk about this. And then let's just move on with our life. And I don't know if they forgot about him. I've been told by a couple of former veterans that they probably didn't forget about it, that maybe they just were hoping that one of their children would, um, do something about it when they, um, they were found. And they were found by sheer accident. So my mission in sharing this information is A, to remind people that yes, this horror happened. We cannot forget about it. Just like I never forgot the pictures I saw when I was a little girl. I feel it's a calling, a mission, whatever you want to refer to it as, to be able to tell millions so that, I'm sorry, to be able to tell thousands so that millions will know what Dachau is and never forget the name of Dachau. My other mission is to help us think about how can we, in the sphere of the world that we live in, how can we make a difference against cruelty, bigotry, hatred, bullying, I mean, there's so many difficult, ugly things that are going on. And each of us, we don't have to be out there uh, protesting. I mean, we can, like, I don't know how many of you know Bob Cooper Ryder, but he goes to Africa and works with some people in Africa around grains and developing wheat and granary machines. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and, I mean, he's doing a fabulous thing. I can't do that anymore, you know? But I can make a difference by talking to groups of people. Each of us can talk to groups of people. If you hear somebody who says, oh, the Holocaust didn't happen, it's no big deal, you can say, wait a minute. On uh, April 23rd in the Canby Library, I heard this woman talk about her father's experience at Dachau. We can make a difference. 
Children can make a difference. Our children are our future. When I'm in my retirement home playing bingo, uh, I've never played bingo, but I have a feeling bingo's in my future. Um, our young people, and the young people in the back, are gonna be the people who make a difference. So I encourage you um, to reflect on this, to think on this, and to think about how you can make a difference. When I talk to high school students, and I've been talking to a lot of like sophomores who are, you know, 15-ish, and of course they can't vote. And I said, you know, the pen is mightier than the sword. Write your congresspeople. Write Jeff Merkley. Write um, Senator Wyden. Write DeFazio. I'm not sure who your is DeFazio your representative here? Okay, he's ours. Um, write them letters. Tell them, I'm gonna be voting in three years. These are the issues that are of concern to me. Encourage your children, your grandchildren, to, to make a difference. There's so many issues in this world. Now, I know I'm sounding kind of like I'm lecturing and telling you what to do, but it's really, these are some of the lessons that I've learned from this. So I hope and pray that all of you, I thank you for coming, I thank you for listening, and I thank you for making a difference in our world. I think just the fact that you're here is, is making a difference. So what I'd like to do is um, thank you for coming, and also we've got plenty of time for uh, question and answers if, um, if you want. I think I, oh, I'm sorry, I missed a picture. This is his bronze star that he got. And this is, um, oh, I just forgot a whole section. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I get kind of carried away. Uh, his arm band, and then um, his pass from Dachau concentration camp that says he's a member of the permanent staff. When I first saw that, I was just like, ugh. But it's because when he had to come and go, it showed that he was legitimate, I guess. Anyway, he, uh, the letters were kept uh, hidden. So this is a part, I can't believe, this is a brand new slide, this is why I forgot it. On October 11th of 2018, I went to Dachau and I met with the director of research and the archivist about my father. I took them information, I took them samples of letters, I took them copies of newspaper articles, and they were very, uh, very wonderful. And the people I went with, at the end, I said, well, Warren, I kind of thought they'd be jumping up and down. And he said, oh, they were jumping up and down. They were just jumping up and down the way a historian would jump up and down. <laughs> he said, you didn't see them looking at each other. He said, well, then the true example of them jumping up and down, in my estimation, was they had uh, arranged for us to have a tour of Dachau. And it was like three or four football fields long. And Dr. Riedler, the director of research, all of a sudden appeared where we were waiting for the, um, the, the tour guide. And she said, oh, I really want you to come back and talk to me some more. So she'd had that hour or so to think about what she had heard. So she was being kind of reserved and thinking about it. And then in that hour that we were gone, it was like, I want more information. So we came back and talked to her for an hour and a half longer. So this picture on the upper far right is a very profound, if you could see it in person, a very profound sculpture of emaciated bodies. On the lower right is the tomb of the unknown Holocaust victim. And there's four corners, and it's the same words in English, Yiddish, German, and French. On the lower left, you may know that the Jewish people were required to wear yellow badges. Well, as I said in one of the earlier slides, Dachau had a lot of political prisoners, so those different colors were the badges of what those political dissidents or what have you, to indicate who they were and what their, uh, their crime was. And then on the upper left, you may have heard the phrase, never again. I've said never forget. But the phrase, logo, mission, statement of the Holocaust Museum in uh, Washington, D.C. is never again. And never again is written in Yiddish, French, 
English, German, and Russian. And to me, standing in front of that sculpture statue was so profound to see it in all those different languages. Now, I don't know if you know what Yiddish is, but Yiddish is a language that's spoken by Jewish people, but it's made up of high German words, uh, some Amer um, Aramaic, and Central and Eastern European languages, Slavic languages, and some Romance languages. But the basis, I think, is Hebrew. So I'm not a Yiddish scholar, but that's what I've understood it to be. So if somebody wants to correct me on that, I'd be more than welcome to have you do that. You would be more than welcome to do that. So I forgot that, because this is the first time I've shown that slide. <laughs> uh, but it just happened last October. So anyway, back to my ending. And um, thank you for being here. And if you have any questions, hi. Uh, this is my friend Nina, who came all the way from Portland. <laughs> Nina and I have been friends for 30-some years, and then Denny and Bob Cooper Ryder um, to date us. Denny and I have been friends since the eighth grade, and I was one of her bridesmaids almost 53 years ago, and her husband, who goes to Africa many times and helps people there with uh, developing crops. Is that a fair way to say it? Okay. So, questions? Yes? Have you ever thought of putting this out in a book? Um, I am in the process of writing a book. Okay. Yes. Um, I don't know if you, um, you probably don't you read the Eugene Register Guard very often, but um, Bob Welch is a columnist of 30 years, and he's written 20-some books. Uh, and he and I are in the process of co-writing a book. And if you want to read a fascinating book, it's called American Nightingale, and it's about a Jewish woman who, uh, when she was seven, escaped Poland with her family, moved to Massachusetts, became a nurse, was on the ship when Normandy landed, and then she was the first nurse to die uh, after Normandy. And it's called American Nightingale by Bob Welch. The small world is, she was stationed at Fort Devens, Massachusetts. My dad was stationed there. She was a nurse at Level General Hospital in Massachusetts. My brother was born at Level General Hospital. So anyway, it's a fascinating book. Um, on those pictures that you're What? Ask the question. Could you step this up to the microphone? Well, here, why don't I do this? Can I just hand it to people? OK. On those pictures that you have of, of them all looking around the operating table, is there something on the back that says why they were all at one table instead of spread out looking on the back of the pictures? Because that's not really a normal that's way. That's a good question. I don't know. I'll have to look. Oh, I thought maybe they No, I, I don't know. That's a really good question. Because that I wouldn't be. Yeah, there. usually there aren't that many people. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I've learned something new every time I give a talk. Do you know if the former prisoners were released when your dad left? Or were um, I think they were released slowly as they got healthier. So then other doctors had to come in once your dad left yeah. and mm -hmm. help them. Yeah. They took care of the most critically ill, and then when they got there, I'm suspecting a lot of people did die because they were so close to death. But then they slowly released people as they got healthier. And I think the ones who got healthier quicker probably were the ones who came in later in the war than earlier in the war. Good question. Yes? I have a comment in that lower right picture there. Yeah. Uh, in the mid-60s, when I was in the service, I visited Dachau prison camp. And there was a sign before that that said, this is a grave of thousands unknown. Oh. So, I don't know where that came from. Wow. It was, it was posted after that. Was that in the 60s, maybe? Yes. Well, I know that somewhere in late 60s, they did kind of kind of a redevelopment of the camp, and I wonder if they changed it. So tell me that quote again, because I want to ask it, about it. It said, uh, grave of thousands unknown. Wow, that's powerful. There's a big man. Say it louder so we can hear. Graves of thousands unknown. It was a grave. 
oh, a grave of thousands of known, unknown. I'm going to ask the Holocaust people about that. That's really powerful. Yes. Um, in, in 1972, um, my brother and I went to Europe, and we actually went through the Dachau um, concentration camp. And the, um, the sculpture that you're talking about, you know, is, is, is big, and at that is, of course, very powerful. But then going through the, the museum part, um, where they had all the photographs and stuff, one thing that really struck me was that it was so quiet in there that you could hear a pin drop, and all you saw was people with just silent tears, you know, and, and that, that was really one of the most powerful things I... And that is exactly what I saw when I was at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. You know, outside it was a spring break and kids were, you know, yeah. punching and hitting and laughing and joking. And you went in there and it was just, you could hear a pin drop. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sculpture of emaciated bodies. I can't see it. Yeah, it's hard to see because um, I think if you come, maybe if you, after we're done talking, go up and look at that one. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's bigger than like the, the, the screen up there. It's, it's, it's quite large. Oh, have you seen it? Yeah. yeah. Sure it's is that a good description? Yeah, yeah. it is. But, but, it, but it's, it's, it's more modern. It's uh, very modern, yeah. So it, it just looks like um, maybe yeah. like tree trunks or something. Right. Bones. Yeah. Other questions? Did your father continue to practice medicine? Yes, he there? practiced medicine. Um, he retired in 30 some years. Okay. And then he died in 1996. Hmm. And you were a cute baby. Oh, thank you. You <laughs> were <laughs> cute. Good, you get an A for today. <laughs> Will you sign a book? Sure, I'll sign a book. I'd be happy to sign a book. Any other questions? Yes. Can you tell me again the, the time frame of when he began writing the letters to when they September stopped? of 1944 through um, 1946. Oh, 46, okay. Yeah. But the, the really ugly letters were probably more from October, November, December of 44 through August of 45. Okay. Because August of 45, um, the, the war was over, mm -hmm. victory in Europe, um, I mean, victory in Japan. And so, hmm. right. so, yes. Of the 300, I'm sorry, of the 300, how many of them dealt with Dachau, would you say? 60. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I just wanted to know what to look up in July to find the letters online. Okay. Um, it's called the David Wilsey Collection. So um, go to the Holocaust Museum of Se in Seattle. It's on 2nd and Lenora. And um, I'm sure that they'll, if they don't have it, I would be surprised if they didn't ha announce it on their, their front page of their website. And then there would be a phone number there if you couldn't find it and you could ask them. But probably if you want to read the ones that are the most um, descriptive, it's probably going to be January through like July of 45. Did I see a hand over here? Yeah. Is there much of an effort with the public schools or schools in general to talk about the Holocaust? Okay, yeah. very exciting. Um, Governor Inslee of Washington this week signed a law that says schools have to teach Holocaust and genocide education. Our state legislature just passed that they had to do that. It's now in the House of Representatives and on May 2nd at the Capitol in Salem, they're going to be here having a hearing about whether to require training, uh, education of Holocaust education, genocide education in the public schools. Good. I should have paid you for that question. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's kind of crazy that it hasn't been required. Because I've, I've uh, talked to, well, heard from somebody who was a Holocaust survivor 
driver, and they said that um, they go around to different schools to talk about their experiences. I think he was in Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And what he said was, is there some uh, like high schoolers that come up to him, not necessarily in Canby, they have no idea what it is, which is just unbelievable to I me. Know. I know. And question him about it. I know. Well, um, a lot of the schools that do teach Holocaust education are really night, N-I-G-H-T by Elie Wiesel, who is a, um, Nobel Peace Prize winner. They read Anne Frank, which maybe some of you all read, you know, when you were in school. Um, those are the two, uh, and then there's a boy in striped pajamas. It's really a sad story. Um, but there's a number of different books that they're reading in schools now. But they're going to be developing a curriculum. And what I'm excited about is that I could be part of that because Let's face it, a lot of the survivors that are still around were very small children. Or they're, so, they're in their 90s and they don't have the energy and the what have you to be going around on a heavy speaking schedule. On, uh, <clears throat> um, this year on Oregon Battle of the Books in the school, there was a, a book that was for reading called Hannah's Suitcase. Yes, yes, yes. And that I know was the other one I, I forgot. Info. Mm -hmm. If they if they participated in Battle of the Books, they would have read that. Book. Okay, good. Yeah, Hannah's suitcase. That, when I paused for a second, I was that was the book I was trying to remember. I'm just curious. Um, what brought you here? Why were you wanting to hear about this? Love history, and I've been to Auschwitz. Okay. I took a grandson. Over oh, good for you. Through Europe. Mom, love to travel, love knowing about it. Oh, good. I think I can't imagine us wimping out because our TV doesn't work or something today when they've lived through all of that. Yeah, you know? exactly. Thank you for educating your grandson. That's wonderful. Oh, all of them. Yeah. They're all history, kind of. Oh, good. That's, I talk what, about it. What else brings you here? I know you're here because of me. No. <laughs> daughters and I did a Europe trip five years ago when they were like 21, 20, and 16, and uh, was in Germany for three weeks and just went around to different. But I would say when my daughters were even younger, and if your kids have the opportunity to do that DC trip, um, I went as a chaperone and we went to the Holocaust Museum. And at the time, we only thought we'd spend an hour there. We were ended up being there for four, <laughs> just because it's so powerful. And you were probably exhausted. Yeah, well, and we didn't, you know, there was a huge line. And so we thought, oh, we're not going to. And then my husband, who's retired military, saw something that said, oh, if you're military, you get to move to the front of the line. So, so then, yeah, so we went oh, ahead and did wonderful. that. But I just, yeah, and when they talk about that trip to DC, when people asked them after we came back, it was the Holocaust Museum that they mentioned most, like the most powerful thing about Washington, DC. Mm -hmm was that and not having, you know, that and when we went to Pearl Harbor and oh, that was yeah. the other. So yeah, my husband and I, I mean, we've done a lot of our trips to Europe. We do, we've, we've done the beaches of Normandy and all of that just to, well, to you remember. Well, be interested in the Nightingale book, American Nightingale, by um, what you said about uh, your children liking the, the museum. Uh, sort of to brag a second, a friend of mine's friend, uh, her, her grandson and friend were studying the Holocaust in their middle school, uh, oh no, freshman year in high school, and Mona called and said, would it be okay, my grandson and his friend want to go to the Holocaust Museum in Seattle, would it be okay if we looked at the letters, because right now all those letters are in what they call cold storage to preserve them. I said, sure, so I called the museum and said, you know, let them into the cold and look at the letters, and they both said later to their grandmother, un, you know, unencouraged, they said the favorite part of the trip to the museum was seeing the letters. Because actually, they're there, you know? Any other questions or reasons that you're here? Or? Hmm? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Nina. Okay. 
So um, I'm here because I feel like I've been with you on this journey from your discovering your father in the Holocaust Museum film to discovering the letters. We've been friends for 30 years. Yes. <laughs> and um, I was, I wanted to hear what you had to say. I mean, I've, we've talked on the personal level and I've been on that journey on the personal level with you, but I wanted to see, um, to hear what you've pulled together to present. And I just also want to thank you for, um, for not only discovering this and learning more for yourself about your father, um, but for sharing it. And you, um, you really have um, made it your mission to bring this story um, and his experience to life. And um, I just think you deserve kudos mm -hmm. for, you. for doing this. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, any shy people that... <laughs> well, make a difference. You've made a difference coming here. Make a difference with your children, your grandchildren. Um, if somebody is in your presence, tries to deny the Holocaust or any kind of genocide, don't hit them, but just tell them. <laughs> tell them they're wrong. So thank you so much for coming. It's still light out, so. Thank you very much.